Good morning, folks. We'll go ahead and get ready because I know that everybody wants those few extra seconds at the end of class to continue with their conversations. So I'll begin us in prayer and then we'll jump right into our topic today, which is the image of God and how it relates to the mission of God. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious and heavenly Father, thank you again for another opportunity to gather a little earlier this morning together. We're so happy to be here to worship you and to celebrate your son's name, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, today is our last class, and I have to thank all of you for being here. I have really enjoyed teaching this class and appreciate all of the feedback that you guys have given me throughout. So today's class is going to be the same structure as the past two weeks. I'm going to briefly review what we've been talking about, introduce today's new topic. We'll watch a video for about 18 minutes, and then we'll divide into small groups for some discussion time. If you haven't gotten a handout, they're on the back table. There's a um, large print version, if that's something that uh, would be helpful for you. Uh, we started our conversation on the Imago Dei, or the image of God, by looking at exactly what that means. How do we image God? And we talked about that we imaged him in both the way that we are and in the things that we do. And I labeled those as functional and structural, structural aspects um, of our beings. And we looked at that in terms of creation, fall, uh, redemption, and then restoration. And how Adam and Eve were created in a sense of true freedom in which they were able to fulfill God's will. They were able to align their will with God's will, but they also were able to sin and ended up sinning. And then we looked at how in the fall, we did not lose our image of God. It just became perverted. Then in Christ, uh, we are redeemed and we are able to then uh, have a renewed image and we're growing through sanctification and becoming more like the perfect image of God, which Christ represents for us. And we'll eventually get to a state of perfect freedom at our restoration in which our wills, once again, will align with God's will, and uh, we will not be able to sin. So we looked at that for the first uh, two weeks, and then we looked, about, looked at the image of God in ourselves and how that gives us dignity, but also gives us a sense of humility and the fact that we are not God. Then we looked at how that relates to how we should view other people and see the inherent dignity of the image of God in them. So last week we talked about how to steward this power that God has given us as image bearers um, and his mandate to rule over creation and how that influences our relationship with people. And so today we're looking more specifically um, on the mission of God. And we're going to be looking at the Great Commission in Matthew as our anchor passage. But let's go ahead and look at our class objectives today and some essential questions. So our uh, goal for today is to examine the Imago Dei and the Messio Dei, or the mission of God. Focusing on reasons being made in God's image should motivate, motivate us to share the gospel. The gospel message is meant to go out to the nations who in all their wondrous diversity bear God's image in a thousand different ways. And so three questions that I hope you'll be able to answer before the end of class include, what is the relationship between God's original mandate in Genesis 1 and the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20? How does humanity reflect the missionary dimensions of God's character? And how is the mission of God related to the worship of God? Here is our anchor text for today. You'll find it in your handout. The first page of your handout um, includes the 10 aspects from the video that are gonna be covered. I included those once again for you. And then following that is our scripture, our anchor text and then other scripture references from the video. So if you wanna follow along with the anchor text, it's there for you on your handout. It says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we're going to jump into the video. It's about 18 minutes long, and then we'll break up into our discussion groups.
It's very important to recognize the entailments of monotheism. That is, if there is just one God, then it follows that he is necessarily the God of all, acknowledged or otherwise. In other words, one of the entailments of, of monotheism is mission. Um, and, and, and that focuses not least in the God-man sent by the Father uh, to bear our sins in his own body on the tree. He, he, he does not come um, for a, a different set of species, um, black human beings, yellow human beings, red human beings, white human beings, uh, all dutifully ranked. Uh, rather, there's an emphasis in the New Testament that, that, that God, precisely because he is the one God, is the God of all, whether recognized or not. That's one of Paul's great themes in the Athenian address in Acts chapter 17. It's part of his theological reasoning in our universal sinfulness in the opening chapters of Romans. And, um, and, and the ultimate anticipation is of a new heaven and a new earth where, where there are people from every language and tongue and people and nation. I'll never forget my wife was in a Walmart with my daughter, my five-year-old daughter, and there was an African-American lady, and my daughter blurts out loud, Mom, why is she a different color than we are? And, and, and the lady turned around, and so my wife is relaying the story to me, and I'm thinking, Meredith, what did you say? And, and Meredith said, well, I, I said, honey, God has made mankind to reflect his glory. He's made him in his image to reflect his glory. And God is so glorious that one color would not suffice. And so that's why God made people of various colors. And I was like, wow, well done, <laughs> you know? God's heart beats for all the nations. Uh, he tells in John 10, the Jews of his day, that I have sheep that are not of this fold and I must draw them also so that there'll be one flock and one shepherd. And so in eternity, we know that what the kingdom is gonna look like is there's gonna be people from every tribe, tongue, and nation surrounding the throne of God giving him praise. And so I think uh, when we don't have a heart for all nations, then man, not only do we not understand the Imago Dei, but really we don't understand the gospel and we don't understand God's heart and his mission for all the nations to know him. One of the most striking things about the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the variety of people and people groups and ethnicities and cultures that are all there, whether they're being obedient or not, they're all there helping God to unfold his plan. Of course, his plan being his covenant promise to keep a people unto himself that comes from all those people. And I think one of the gravest mistakes that was made in mission history was um, allowing one people group to elevate itself over the others, uh, to assume that one cultural ethnicity was Christian and everybody else was other. So how do you undo that heresy? Well, the thing is we call it out, but we don't have to undo it because God has kept a line of people who understood that the image of God was granted to all human beings. If he's sovereign over all things, it also follows that he's working through all those people groups to advance his kingdom purposes, right? Of course, we find the equalization back again at the foot of the cross. So in terms of mission, in terms of mission, if our anthropology, our theology, and our Christology is right, then we follow that line of historical people that God has preserved to acknowledge that no man can be God over another man. And the life and the work that we do, the mission work that we do, rather than becoming a destructive force like we've seen in some places, actually becomes a regenerating, life-giving force. Jesus, when he left us uh, to go back to heaven, gave us what we call the Great Commission. Uh, go and make disciples of all the nations, all the ethnes. But one of the things we need to remind ourselves is every ethne bears the image of God. Every individual in every ethnic group on the planet bears the image of God. We also recognize that today there are more than 6,500 unreached people groups. We now know that there are approaching 4 billion people that have either no access or limited access to the gospel. And yet every single one of them is important to God because they bear his image. 
Furthermore, we know that Christ died for every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. So when you put together both anthropology and soteriology, we have a double mandate to be concerned about their eternal destiny, even to be concerned about their current status and situation. One of the things we've learned uh, throughout history is where the gospel goes, uh, not only are people's eternal destiny changed, but their level of livelihood is also raised almost without exception. And so there's a double blessing that we can bring to the nations, uh, to every ethnic group, to every imager, uh, if we pursue the Great Commission in the way I believe Christ intended it for us to. From the very beginning of the Bible story, it's clear that creation is headed somewhere, that there is a mission for the people of God. He gave it to Adam and Eve there in the garden. We read that he created man in his own image. And in the very next verse, we read, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. So from the very beginning... God's intention has been to have a people made in his image that fill the earth. As they were fruitful and multiplied, the earth would be filled with image bearers, people who reflected the glory of God. That was his original intention. And of course, the first Adam failed in that. <laughs> And this is why we love the gospel, that there came another son, a second Adam. And in a sense, the mission is still the same. It's still God's intention that the earth would be filled with image bearers who reflect the glory of God. So that's why we see after the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, we come to Acts. And what's happening? He, he's he tells his disciples after the ascension that they're going to take this message of the gospel and they're going to begin there in Jerusalem and then go to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. To what aim? The very same aim as it was at the beginning. That as they give out the gospel, as people take hold of Christ by faith, that they would be changed, that they would be being transformed from glory to glory so that the original mission will be accomplished. And that is that the earth will be filled with the glory of God and those who bear the image of the glory of God, uh, the way Habakkuk says, says it, as the waters cover the sea, the whole earth filled with image bearers reflecting his glory. God's mission is that his name would be known and he'd be glorified in all the earth. The method that he is using to do that is people, which is quite amazing in one sense, because you think about it, God in his power could have, he could have redeemed the whole created order, humans included, by speaking it, or, you know, by, he could, do, could have done it in an instance, in other words, and yet he has chosen to use people um, to accomplish his mission. And even if you think about the Old Testament and some of the, the miracles that happen, almost always God uses a person to accomplish even these amazing miracles, Moses in the Red Sea, um, even when the Israelites are in the wilderness, um, when Moses, when God feeds the people through his leader Moses, um, the manna and even the water, he is using people to accomplish his mission um, in small ways like that and then in the overarching redemptive way as well. Some would argue that the image isn't so much what we are, but what we do. So when God created Adam and Eve in his image, it says then he gave them dominion over the earth. Uh, and so the, the idea is that as we exercise dominion over the earth, as we expand God's rule throughout the globe, that we are giving expression to the reality of what that image really is. And then also in both Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, uh, Paul talks about how there is progressively being renewed in us this new self, literally the new man that is being shaped after the likeness of God. Now, if we think about that, the way it would impact our relationship to the world as a whole, think about what may well be one of the greatest struggles and uh, problems that we see in society, especially in, in the non-Christian world, and that is a loss of sense of personal identity. Who am I? Do I matter? Do I have meaning? Do I have value? 
Um, so many who take a naturalistic worldview would honestly have to view themselves as nothing more than a chance conglomeration of molecular reactions over millions of years of evolutionary development. What value can that person have? But when we communicate with them, no, you need to understand, you have been shaped in the image of God. You are a reflection, even though it's a damaged reflection because of what we've done in sin, you are a reflection in the, in the very essence of who you are of the Creator Himself. And that is the way in which you can come into a, a, a true sense of your personal identity. Who are you? Why are you on this earth? And then also, uh, if we think of the image as the ultimate goal for which God not only created but redeemed us in Christ, is that He might transform us in accordance with the image of His own Son. And so I would appeal uh, to people uh, who don't know Christ to think about not only who you are, but why are you here? And the Word of God tells us that you are here in order to reflect in how you think and talk and act and relate with others, what you do with your time and your talents. All of that as an expression of the glory and the beauty and the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, after whose image you are being progressively shaped and transformed. Uh, so we, we planted a church almost seven years ago called Imago Day, and I still have sermon notes from about 10 years ago when I was teaching through some uh, a theology class at, at the church where I was at at the time. And I have in my notes, uh, if I ever plant a church, I want to call it Imago Day. And um, I really had two motivations, two, two thoughts in mind. Uh, one was we want to be a church that loves everyone, um, regardless of age, regardless of race, regardless of background. Uh, the doctrine of Imago Day uh, inspires and informs the way uh, we treat people. And so I really wanted that to be embedded in our church, that we, we are a welcoming people because we believe in the Imago Dei. And then we also wanted to use it because to be made in the image of God means many things in terms of reflecting the character of God, right? You could talk about being made in the Imago Dei. We are relational people. We are moral people. Um, but we're also a missional people because our God is a, a missionary God. And to be made in the Imago Dei uh, implies that we are to be a missionary people. And so our God is not a tribal deity over one nationality. He is the, the God of the nations. And uh, I mean, you see this right from cover to cover in the Bible from the choosing of Abraham, that I, I, you will be the father of many nations. And you, 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 you're anticipating the Messiah through the Old Testament and all of these prophecies about the nations and the Messiah and Jesus comes and Acts is, uh, you know, we read the book of Acts and the church begins to, to uh, uh, preach the gospel throughout uh, the known world. And in Revelation, Jesus has a people for himself from every tribe and tongue. And so um, if, if, if you just read the storyline of the Bible, you see two things. You see the, a messianic focus in the whole Bible. But because there's that messianic focus, you also see this missional focus. Uh, the two really go together. Everyone is of inestimable, inestimable worth to God the Father. And so, although the world will have ways of making some people worth more or worth less, the gospel shows us everyone has supreme worth. And so, whatever the world may think of a particular group of people, we should be thinking they're made in the image of God, they were made to know God, and we owe them the very same gospel that people brought to us. And it's good for us to bear in mind that the first people who... It's good for me to bear in mind that the very first people who went around sharing the gospel did not look like me, did not dress like me, did not talk like me. And yet because they saw the worth of every human being hearing the gospel, the gospel came to people who looked like me. And so I'm at the service of cross-cultural mission because I wouldn't be have become a Christian apart from cross-cultural mission. The gospel would not have reached my neighborhood and my country were it not for people recognizing that actually us pasty people in the North Atlantic were also worth reaching with the gospel. The meta-narrative of scripture, the, the major symphonic movements of creation and fall and redemption and, and new creation those are familiar to every gospel-minded Christian. 
Uh, they come to us just by reading scripture and understanding these giant symphonic moves that tell us the storyline of scripture. But sometimes when we're thinking about certain questions, such as the image of God or such as the gospel, or just summarize it as the Great Commission, we, we don't take the time to connect how the storyline of scripture puts this all together in one symphonic whole. In the first chapter of scripture, we have humanity made in God's image, as God's image. And then we come in the storyline of scripture to the fall. And there the image is not destroyed, but it is corrupted. And human beings are confused. And that confusion can turn uh, not only dangerous, but, but very deadly. And it's confusion from which human beings cannot extricate ourselves. We, we, can't, we can't rescue ourselves. And uh, the problem of sin requires a redeemer. And, and, and then for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. The world language in John is going right back to the world language in Genesis. Genesis 1 and John 1 tied together. John 3, God so loved the world. Well, how does God love the world? Does God love whom in the world? It's, it's the image bearers for whom he died. And then you come to the end of the Gospel of Matthew, and the text we know is the Great Commission, to go into all the world. Well, to whom are we going? We're going to image bearers. Image bearers who, like us, are now sinners who desperately need to hear the Gospel of Jesus Christ in order that hearing, they would believe and believing, they would be saved. And of course, this is pointing us towards eschatology and the marriage supper of the Lamb, where image bearers from every tongue and tribe and people and nation are gathered together, declaring the, uh, the worthiness of the Lamb. And, and you look at all that and you say, how does the image of God, just as, as one biblical theme, how does it hold fast and continuous and true? It, it shows us its grounding in creation and in God's purpose before the creation of the entire cosmos. It follows through the, the, the reality of the fall and then the glory of redemption. But then it points us to a greater glory yet, greater than the garden, where image bearers who in the garden talked with God in the cool of the day, now are at a marriage supper festival. And, and, and after all the confusion of Babel and the dispersal to all the nations, and after every evidence of human confusion and every corruption and denial of human dignity and the image of God in each other, now redeemed humanity, representing every nation, is seated at a table which is a festival, which is even greater so than in the garden. for today's discussion, I separated into three categories again and forced a little bit of the categorization, but you'll see in your handout, discussion one, I just pulled words right out of the Great Commission. So the first conversation is kind of around the idea of go, therefore. And then discussion number two is around the phrase, make disciples of all the nations. And discussion number three is around the idea of I am with you always. Um, again, uh, when you get into your groups, if someone will, will be your facilitator or you guys can take turns if you wish, um, but just know that it is kind of divided into facilitator question, facilitator question, and don't feel like you have to spend the whole time on the first conversation if you don't get to the last section. You're welcome to continue with discussion one or go ahead and move on to the, to the second. So your group can decide for itself how it wants to, to proceed. I'll interrupt you uh, on occasion to give you an idea of when a third of your time has passed and then two thirds of your time has passed so your group can make a decision whether to move on or to continue with the conversation that you're on. I'll go ahead and give you a minute to get in your groups. Thank you all once again for participating in the conversation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you would make a great teacher. <laughs> it's like the first day of teacher education. Turn on the light, turn off the light. Is there anything um, that you want to share from your discussions today or any kind of overarching idea that you have a takeaway from the class that anyone would like to share?
That's fine. You, you've had a lot of share time, so yes. Thank you. Oh. It has been my pleasure. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, two things. That this is a nice segue, not right away, but eventually when Peter Chase is going to address us this summer about the missions field and all the work that is underway. And this is just, I will be coming back to this, you know, because this is the mindset we need to have when we're stepping out. And then we kept coming back in our group to the fact that all of this, any kind of outreach, requires relationship. You know, it's all built on relationship and trust, and whether that's in a family or in a small group or in a church, you know, but it just, it's foundational that we need to have the relationship with Jesus and that we take that and build relationships with others. Well, Melissa is in my head, but that's also because she's on the committee with me. <laughs> so um, it actually will start next week. So this is a great lesson to lead us in. A year ago, the uh, session of the church commissioned a uh, missions task force to investigate, well, to investigate, to uh, gain a better understanding of what missions looks like currently at our church and what kind of direction we as a church would like to move in terms of mission. So uh, Peter Chase will begin next week with a discussion on missions in the church and the kind of the findings and the recommendations of that task force. So I know that he and others are at Theopolis uh, this weekend, and so they were kind of going to experience that and solidify their thoughts and, and then present to the congregation upon their return. So this is a perfect segue into that, as Melissa said. So thank you very much for bringing that up, because I was afraid I was going to forget it. <laughs> so thank you. And, and thank you all, because I know this was a different kind of structure and kind of new. And I've seen you guys grow in terms of conversation. And I certainly over planned today. <laughs> um, so I think the first week, we probably would have gotten through all this. But you're building those relationships, as Melissa was talking about, and trusting each other with your thoughts on this concept. So. I really appreciate your participation. Let's close in prayer and then join together for worship upstairs. God, we know you have, you have deep compassion for lost image bearers. You've reached out throughout history to Abraham, to Israel, and ultimately to us through your son. Now you send us as your redeemed image bearers. Give us courage and faith to go with confidence in the fact that you go before us and that your word will bear fruit. Help us invite image bearers to come alive again as your image, in restored, is, as your image is restored in them. May your spirit be at work as we share our stories and the hope of the gospel. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.